So good to see everybody this morning. Well, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to, to speak to our hearts this morning. Father, I thank you for the gift of your word and the testimony in the book of Acts of the mighty works you have done, the examples you've provided for us, the warnings you've given us, the admonishments and encouragement. And Lord, we pray that today our hearts would be receptive, that we would tremble at your word, that we would bow before you in awe and wonder. I thank you for the flock, Lord, those here whom you purchased with your own blood, and I pray that you would use this message to strengthen them, to run the race, to win the prize, to keep their eyes set, Lord Jesus, to heed your voice as you lead them, our good shepherd. And Lord, we thank you. We consecrate this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good to see everybody here this morning. We're going to be doing, uh, the topic is devoted. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is, you shall keep with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. We know this. One of the problems with knowing verses well is sometimes we think we know them well, <laughs> right? And that, this is one of these, these verses that constantly calls us higher and calls us deeper. We never, we never get beyond this verse. In fact, Jesus says that on this law and the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, hang all the law and the prophets, that if we get this one right, the rest of the things, the rest of the commandments just fall into line, don't they? Everything kind of flows and hangs from these. Well, the Shema, the first commandment here, it's tied to the concept of covenant. It's part of God's covenant with Israel. And then, of course, in the new covenant, Jesus reiterates this to us as well. And it highlights the fact that God is a covenantal God that he binds himself, not just in a casual relationship, but a solemn relationship. That the marriage covenant is one of the, the pictures throughout the scriptures from beginning to end that is used to describe God's relationship with us. This solemn vow that we make when we say I do to our spouse, that this is the type of solemn relationship that God has with his people. And I want to read a quotation here by a scholar named Jeffrey Niehaus. He teaches at Gordon-Conwell Seminary. He says, God's behavior, according to the Bible, is always covenantal. That is, God has always chosen to relate to humanity through various covenants he has ordained. It is also true that the whole Bible is a product of the covenantal relationships God has instituted among humans. Since that is the case, the whole Bible may be called covenantal literature. I love that. It is so true that the Bible is about a covenant and a covenant-making God, covenantal literature. Now, within a covenantal context, love refers primarily to loyalty. And just to read another uh, quotation here from the United uh, Bible Society Handbook series, love and its distinctive biblical understanding is always relational and often implies faithfulness and loyalty. In fact, when you're reading the book of Deuteronomy, the context in which the Shema is first given, you get a really good picture of what love means. And, you know, as much as, you know, somebody may love, you know, we love our morning devotions with Oswald Chambers and a good, Oswald Chambers, a good cup of coffee and Chris Tomlin in the background, you read the book of De Deuteronomy and you're like, wait a minute, there's a lot more to this thing than that. Although, you know, any way that we go deeper in the knowledge of God and devote time to Him in prayer is obviously important. But love is loyalty at its core. Our, our loyalty to God doesn't waver with depending on how we're feeling in a certain day. Just like in a marriage, our spouse may have good bad breath or bad breath, right? Or in sickness and in health, either one. We're loyal. We're committed. We, we, we made the vows. And when we realize that at the heart of biblical love is loyalty, 
It makes a lot more sense of a lot of passages that sometimes you, when you first read them, you're like, wait a minute, I, I don't quite get that. Let me give a New Testament example from Matthew 10. Anyone who loves their father or mo mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Well, is Jesus telling me to hate my parents? Obviously not. He's not saying don't try to get rid of any affection you have for your parents. But he's saying that if your parents ever make demands that cause you or call you to compromise your loyalty to the Creator, you always go with the Creator. And that loyalty to parents must never exceed loyalty to Jesus. In fact, loyalty to our own lives must never exceed our loyalty to the Creator. If we love our lives more than Him, if we want to hold on to our lives and preserve our lives, whatever form that takes, then that's a problem, and Jesus has to address it with us. Well, today's, title, today's message is titled Devoted. Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary defines devoted as characterized by loyalty and devotion. When we go into the waters of baptism and we say, yes, I do, to the Creator of heaven and earth, and His Son, Jesus of Nazareth, what are we really saying yes to? What does it mean to be completely loyal to the one true King and Lord of the universe? What does it mean to wholly and fully love, to wholeheartedly devote ourselves to Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified and resurrected King, ascended to the Father's right hand, coming again in power and glory with angels to judge the living and the dead? What does it mean to be fully and wholeheartedly devoted and loyal to Him as a community, as leaders, as families, as individuals, and not only be devoted, but with all that we are, with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength, with our thoughts, our dispositions, our inclinations, our attitudes, our emotions, our choices, and then outwardly as well, our time, our money, our priority, our effort, our energy. What does it look like to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength? That's the main question that we're going to let Acts 5 through 7 paint some of a picture of what that means. Obviously, the whole Bible in some way can pertain to that, but we're going to focus in on Acts 5 through 7. And interestingly, this hit me after I, I said yes to, uh, to this message. Interestingly, Acts chapter 5 opens with people dying, and Acts 7 ends with somebody dying. And I was like, I thought, Derek, man, I didn't write, was, did you divide this up? But anyway, um, and I was talking about this with my, my family the other day, and I said, you know, I told them, I said, yeah, Acts 5 starts with somebody dying, and Acts 7 ends with somebody dying, and Haven pointed out, she said, yeah, but they're very different. And I said, yes, that's the point. In Acts 5, we see two people that God himself directly slays, light topic, right, because of brazen disloyalty. And then by the end at chapter 7, we see Jesus standing up to get ready to welcome the first martyr in the church who is loyal to him even unto death. I mean, stark contrast, one held up before us and written in the scriptures as an example of warning of what not to do and the potential consequences of disloyalty. And the other one held up before us as a model and example of loyalty even unto death. But let's jump in. Acts chapter 5. We're going to look at several different aspects of what Acts 5 through 7, the, paint, the picture it paints of what devotion looks like. Number one, devoted in truth and with fear and trembling. I'm kind of going with the outline of Acts 5 here. The Acts 5 opens with Ananias and Sapphira, so we're going to start there. In Acts 5, we start off with a little light story about a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira. Many of us know the story. They'd sold some property and apparently had committed all of the money to the Lord. There's a, they, you think, oh, they're, 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 being, they're, whole, and they're being wholehearted here. They're giving everything to Him. But then secretly they keep back some of the money for themselves. Uh-oh. <clears throat> they get asked about it. 
And this does not turn, well for them, turn out well for them. Acts 5, let's read it together. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? Whenever somebody speaks to you with that, and that's the opening phrase, you know there's the, the wrong source is involved in this situation. How has Satan so filled your heart? He's the one driving this. You're listening to Satan. That you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. You have not lied just to, to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And a great fear seized all who heard what had happened. And then three hours later, his wife comes in, gives the same story, and she falls down and dies. All right, well, how many messages have we heard about this in church, <laughs> right? If you lie to the Holy Spirit, you're putting yourself at risk of death. Well, we see this um, in the Bible and in the ancient world generally. False oaths and wrong handling of sacred things, things that have been consecrated to the Lord as holy for sacred use. These are very serious offenses in the eyes of God. And they could actually result in divine judgment. In fact, they, you know, intent, just generally intentional and high-handed sins were beyond atonement. Apart from confession, remorse, and acknowledgement of guilt. And within biblical theology, confession and repentance is vital. Con sincere contrition. And God is mercifully willing to, to reduce the punishment upon sincere confession and repentance. In fact... You can move out from the category of high-handed sins for which there's no atonement to, okay, I'll accept an atonement on your, on your behalf. That's a very important piece. Confession and repentance is central. And you see particular warnings about mishandling divine things, things that have been uh, kadesh, consecrated, sanctified as holy, committed to divine use for God's worship for the worship of him and for, for maintaining the temple and things like this. Well, uh, this actually, what we see happen to Ananias and Sapphira is perfectly consistent with what you see in the Bible. It's, it's called karat, being cut off from your people. And you, if you were to look up all the times in the scriptures where that type of language is used, most often it's in relation to offenses directly against God that normally, and many times, things that nobody would even know except God right? But they're still serious in his sight. Nobody was a witness. Nobody saw it. And so God's like, I saw it. And God deals with it. Now, not, not always does he deal with it as severely or in, in, immediate, in the immediate moment as he does here with Ananias and Sapphira. But this is perfectly consistent with a number of statements, both Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, people were not handling the holy things of communion. They were not relating to those correctly. And Paul says to them, that's why some of you have died. And the same th thing that Jesus says to, to Jezebel, she's leading the people into idolatry. Well, that's, again, perfectly consistent with something that if they don't repent, in the case of in Revelation, it says that uh, I've given her time to repent, but she's unwilling and that's usually the assumption here, is that if there's sincere repentance, if Ananias and Sapphira had repented, if they'd taken ownership, if they acknowledged, wait a minute, I'm not telling the truth, more than likely, we would have had a different story about them in the end. So we need to recognize that God's not just being flippant here. This is probably happening after a substantial time of waiting, giving them an opportunity to repent, calling them back. But if he doesn't deal with it, Early on in the, in the Jesus movement here, this is the early days of the Jesus movement. It was important for them to know from the very outset, you don't do this. And this has become an example and a warning to all posterity of believers. And you see something similar happen to Nadab and Abihu. When they mishand, they offered unauthorized fire to the Lord. This was only eight days after the ta tabernacle had been built. They had just consecrated it. The glory of God had filled it. The fire came out from the Holy of Holies and devoured the sacrifice. And then, unfortunately, they went before the Lord. And that's a very serious thing for the highest representatives of the Lord in the land to do something like that was very serious. And they, too, uh, died before the Lord in, the, in His presence. And everybody was afraid. Fear came over the people. And that was what the point was. God was being loving to the people as a whole, through his severity towards the few. And so this is what we have in the early days of the Jesus movement here in Acts 5. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's the point. 
The beginning of the Jesus movement has to start off with the beginning of wisdom. And that's what we see. If Ananias and Sapphira had repented, they probably would have escaped such strong judgment from the Lord. And it says in Acts 5.11, Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. And that was the point. It was that God is, after his waiting and patient delay, he sends a, a severe judgment. It's a warning to the rest of the church. And I guarantee people said, we need not lie to the Holy Spirit. And that's the point. That's the point. So we're starting our, 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 our message today with just a reminder to ourselves from the scriptures that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Number two, we see in Acts 5 to 7 that they're devoted to gathering together. Acts 5, 12b through 13, by common consent, or other, another translation, with one accord, they would all meet in Solomon's colonnade. The NLT says all the believers were meeting regularly. Verse 13, none of the rest dared to join them, but the people praised them highly. I mean, after the Ananias and Sapphira thing, you might think twice about joining the company of believers. And here we have one example where it's a good thing. If, if you're not going to join a church, this would be the good reason. Like, God is present among those people, and I really love my sin, and I know if I don't deal with my sin and I go there, I, yeah, I don't know, and I'm, I'll probably die. Right? I mean, if there's, you know, much better reason than, uh, than uh, maybe others we might have today for people not joining. We don't want people to, if people don't join because God's not in our midst, that's a big problem. <laughs> it's a big problem. But if they're a little scared and timid because God is so powerfully in our midst, that's a good thing. But they were, they were meeting together with common consent, with one accord. It means they, they, they mutually valued and agreed upon the value of, and necessity of what they were doing, the importance of meeting together. <clears throat> they assembled in the temple courts and in houses day after day. It says in Acts 5.42, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And it's important to recognize the context here that the religious leaders had told them to stop teaching, but they didn't because they valued the teaching and they're doing it in more public settings like the temple courts and they're doing it in homes. And their devotion to, to, to the teaching of the word and their commitment to it, even in the face of opposition, indicates their wholehearted devotion to the Lord's Word and His teaching. <clears throat> the closer we get to Jesus' return, the more vital it will be that we gather together regularly, purposefully, and in the fear of God. Let's read Hebrews chapter 10 together. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for He who promises faithful... And this assumes that there's pressures at times that we face to not hold unswervingly, to relax, to let our love grow cold. And therefore, we need the faithfulness of God. But we're, as we're going to see in the next couple of verses, we also need us to be loyal and faithful to one another to spur one another on. Verse 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love, toward loyalty. That makes so much sense in this context, doesn't it? Let us hold unswervingly. Let us be loyal. Let us hold fast. Let us remain in devotion and in commitment to the hope we profess. And let us spur one another on towards love and loyalty and towards good deeds. Keep proclaiming the message and don't cower before threats like we see in Acts 5. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let's stop and say, ask for a second, why? Why were, what was it that was happening that would lead some people to, to stop meeting together? That's a good question to ask. And why would we? Why would we stop meeting together? It's an important for, question for us to ask and say, well, if it's this important, we need to have clarity as to why it's important. What's the goal? What's the objective? So that we're not just meeting together and we're actually distinct just from some other social gatherings. We're different from a sports club. We're different from a country club. We are the saints of God gathered together. And we realize the importance of meeting together. But unto what and for what? And we get one glimpse of it in the next, the next part of the verse. But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. 
As the day gets closer, it's going to be more vital that we understand the value and the importance of meeting together to spur one another on toward love and good deeds because the pressures increase to help to the, the pressures increase so that we won't hold unswervingly. As the pressures, as the pressures to not love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, to not be fully loyal to Him increase, we need to compensate the other side of the, the equation and see God with all of our hearts and say, no, we're going to gather together and we're going to spur one another on and we're going to say, even if the rest of the earth turns its back on you, God, together we're going to stay faithful unto death. Number th The next part, devoted to serving the widow and the vulnerable. Caring for the widow and the orphan. It says in Acts 6, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Imagine that. Even in the early church, disputes, conflicts, who's getting what, who's doing this. Human beings, after all, are co-located. It seems to happen, right? Verse 3, Brothers and sisters, two seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom, will turn this responsibility, other translations, this necessary task, this duty, this work, over to them. Even though there was conflict, they dealt with it. They found people who had wisdom. They had people who had understanding and that were full of the Spirit because God cares about the orphan and the widow and the vulnerable. And therefore, we, too, we do as well. Our witness is to be not only in word, but also in deed. It says in James 1, pure and undefiled religion. Another translation, the CEB set translates it as true devotion. So it fits perfectly in with what we're talking about. True devotion before God is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. We saw a great example of what can happen if you get too stained by the world earlier with Ananias and Sapphira. That's just one example where we have to guard against the ideologies and the thoughts and the, the enticements of this age. But the other side of it is taking care of those who are in distress, who are suffering and afflicted through various, pressure, various pressures and afflictions. And we, as the body of Christ, come around those in our midst and we say, we're with you. And we do it not because we're living for this age, but because we're living for the age to come as is well illustrated by this next verse, Luke 14. But when you give a banquet, invite who? Invite the poor. Invite who? The crippled. Invite who? The lame, the blind. And you'll be blessed. Although they can't repay you, it takes faith. When you don't get anything out of it, and yet you still give, they can't repay you, but you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. You'll be repaid when the Son of Man comes on the clouds of glory with His angels, and you find out He cared about the orphans and the widows and the crippled and the lame, and so did you. And then you'll be rewarded with a reward and a banquet far beyond anything you could have ever imagined. So the age to come, living for the age to come, it has practical form. It looks practical, helping people around us who are in need. Again, we must be witnesses both in word and in deed for it to be authentic and genuine and real in God's eyes. Next, devoted to prayer and the ministry of the Word. We're devoted to seeking God in fear and trembling, not treating Him casually, recognizing He is the Lord, He is the Holy One. We're devoted to meeting together. We're devoted to the widow and the poor and the vulnerable in our midst. But we're also devoted to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Acts 6, 2 through 5. The twelve summoned the whole company of the t disciples and said, It would not be right for us to give up preaching the Word of God, to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, select men to, to fulfill this role, and then go down to verse 4. But we'll devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And this proposal pleased the whole company. This was not them saying that it's more valuable for these functions to take place and that... That, that helping the widow is not important. But they're just saying there's only so much time. <laughs> we gotta, there's a very many important things to do, and we all got to do our part for the body to function well. That's the point here. And 
They devoted themselves to prayer. And we need to recognize that this isn't just for, you know, in this context, it's the, devo- the apostles saying, we'll devote ourselves to prayer. But later on in Colossians 4.2, Paul himself says to the believers there, be devoted to prayer. Keep alert in it with thanksgiving. That when you're praying, it's important to be watchful, which means there's something to watch out for. There's dangers, dangers of temptation, dangers from the devil, various forms of pressures that we face. You've got to be alert, and we've got to recognize that thanksgiving is a vital vital part of the mix as well. We need to be thankful, and that thanksgiving keeps our eyes and our attitudes in the right place when we're going through difficulties at times. Prayer is, is key to discipleship. Do we realize the privilege we've been given, the right of access to approach the living God, that a way has been made for us into the Holy of Holies? He came and preached peace to you who are far away, peace to those who are near. For through Him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. We've been given the Spirit. We've been given access to the King of Kings. And therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. Let us come courageously and boldly without fear in our time of need so that we can receive the grace and mercy and help that we need. Prayer is central to discipleship. It's not just for the cutting-edge prayer ministry. It's not just something we do on the side. It's our lifeblood. Lord, I'm being tempted. Give me strength in this moment. Lord, help me. Lord, give me power. Help me to be loyal to you. There's pressures coming from this side that's trying to pull me away from that wholehearted love and devotion. Help me. Strengthen me. Give me life and power in my inner man. We come boldly into the throne of grace with courage. And he's saying, yes, yes. I just picture, come on. And he gives you that strength on the inside. Prayer, loyalty to prayer. This can't be a side issue. We can't be true disciples if we're not walking with the one who transforms us into the image of Jesus. This is God, and as for the word, devoted to prayer and the ministry of the word. I love Acts 5.20 right here in our passage. It says, go, the angel says to, to, to the apostles when they're freed from jail, go stand and speak to the people in the temple. This whole, the whole message of this life all about this new life, all the words of this life, the very message of life, the thing all human beings are longing for. How do you come, when somebody goes into the grave, how do they come up? Is there hope and life of the Holy Spirit as a deposit preparing us for the day when we experience life and fullness that is coming in the resurrection? The message of life, yes, that's worthy of devoting yourself to, isn't it? What other message are you going to devote yourself to? The message of Walmart? The message of this business or that business? No, the message of life. This is a message worth living for. This is a message worth creating Bethany for, right? I mean, if Bethany doesn't exist to proclaim the message of life, I'm not, that's a, that's a scary place to be, right? But obviously, it's worthy of our time. It's worthy of our devotion. And as we saw, they're teaching in the temple courts. They're proclaiming the message of life in the temple courts. They're proclaiming it from house to house. They're taking the time to do the Bible studies. They're making sure to listen to teachers and, 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 and preachers who are solid, who are anchored, who have the fear of God on their lives. They're not just assuming that because it comes off the press, it's a good thing. No, the message of life. The message of life. It's important to love God's Word enough and treat it like a holy thing. This is a, a message. There is no other message worth living and dying for. It's the very word of life. And we see in Acts 5 through 7 that God is loyal to this message of life as well because he's doing signs and wonders that are extravagant. Not so that somebody can say, oh, I have a great signs and wonder ministry because he says, this is what my son does. This is who he is. This is who I am. Come all, come while there's still time. Then he released his power. They say, yes, he will raise the dead. He just got that guy out of a wheelchair. He just healed that guy. He will raise the dead. I am going to live for him. I am going to be wholehearted to him. That's the reason. God himself testifies to the message with signs and wonders and miracles and power because he's loyal and he's devoted to the message of life. Prayer and the ministry of the word. It's important that we devote ourselves to, to these things. And lastly, 
we see, as I mentioned earlier in the beginning, we see several examples of people being devoted fully, not in part, in the whole, not a little bit, but with all that they are. Acts 5, they're brought before the Sanhedrin, and they're told, you may not preach in this name. And Peter says, we must obey God. And the other apostles too, we must obey God rather than men. You get down to verse 40 in, in Acts 5. His speech, uh, pers uh, Gamaliel's speech pers persuaded the Sanhedrin. Then it goes on and says, they called the apostles in and had them flogged. Nice, I mean, nice little flogging there, right? I mean, they had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus. So flogging and a threat, and they let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they'd been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. And then the next verse is, and they didn't stop teaching. Okay? Number, letter B, uh, the next point. Loyalty to the full counsel of God. Meaning we must have the courage to proclaim the hard things too. Not just the parts of the gospel about that we love, that we hear about all the time, but the warnings, the difficulties. You know, some people don't like to talk about eternal fire. It's not a popular topic. But guess who speaks on it more than anybody else in the ancient world? Jesus of Nazareth. So it's a big problem if you never want to talk about it. How can you call him Lord and not actually take serious the things he says? Right? And... Uh, don't fear those who can destroy the body, but fear the one who can destroy both body and soul and Gehenna, right? Fear him. That, these are the words of our Lord. We can't. We have to have courage to be able to proclaim in the midst of a generation that does not like talking about the hard things. The hard things. We need to be committed to the whole counsel of God and be, ask God to free us from the fear of man. And we see several examples of this. Of course, Acts, uh, excuse me, Stephen's example in his message, he himself is put to death. But we also see the apostles in prison uh, for proclaiming the message. But we also see them proclaiming a difficult message. In Acts 6.14, they say, we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. Remember Matthew 24? Do you see all these buildings standing here? Not one of them will be left standing. This was a word of judgment, and apparently they were, Stephen was proclaiming, yeah, Jesus is going to come and destroy this place, just like he said. Oh, nobody's going to get, how many likes is he going to get on YouTube for that? Oh, sweet, yes. No, no, they, it, it made people angry, but it was true, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He doesn't give us these warnings just because he's being, I just want to be mean. It's because he knows there's, the time is short and he wants people to turn while there's time. And of course, we end with Stephen's death. He says, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then he says, he follows Jesus' own example on the cross. And it says, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep, or obviously a, a, a euphemism for he died. Jesus is moved and stirred. He stands up. And to, to see, yes, he, he has shared in the fellowship of my sufferings. And so here we have the exact polar opposite of extreme loyalty resulting in death. Death in the beginning, the, the, at the start of our, of our section, death resulting from extreme disloyalty. Death resulting from loyalty to the uttermost. <clears throat> you know, we're just going to ask the Lord. Uh, I'll have the te worship team come on up. The Lord knows specifically where we are as a congregation. He knows where the church worldwide is. He knows where we are as individuals. What it may look like specifically in this particular season of your life, of our life as a congregation, among the leaders, 
different places of the world, what it looks like for us to come to that next place of loving him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Raise your heart if you want that. I want that. Stand up if you want that. Stand up. Let's hold our hands before the Lord. And let's, I'm just going to cry out on our behalf for the Lord to write his law on our hearts and minds and to fill us with a new devotion in whatever level, if it's prayer, if it's love for the word, if it's gathering together, if it's saying no to sin, if it's coming into the light and confession and repentance, whatever that needs to look like in your life, let him do it. Let's let him take us to the Stephen side of the spectrum and away from the Ananias and Sapphira side of that spectrum. Father, we call out to you in the name of Jesus. God, write your word on our hearts and our minds. Set us ablaze again, O oh God. Teach us to pray and help us to be committed to prayer. Give us a love for your word, King of the ages. Wake us up and restore in this day and in this hour the fear of the Lord in your church, that holy, cleansing, righteous trembling that comes when we stand in the presence of God Most High, the maker of heaven and earth. God, we know the time is short. Let us make the most of it. Come to our aid. Pray for every family in this congregation. I pray for the leaders. I pray, God, for the children and the husbands and the wives, the students. Father, in the name of Jesus, come. Let a true witness come forth in our day to love you with all that we are in loyalty, in sincerity, and in truth. In Jesus' name.